Hi Cyber Class, it's Professor Opterbeck. I hope you're digging into the materials for our second week and I wanted to give you just a brief uh, introduction overview of some of the newer materials that I assigned for this week. So first I want to talk a little bit about the Verizon and IBM reports and then I want to talk a little bit about uh, the paper of mine, the draft paper of mine that I gave you to read. So talk a little bit about the Verizon report and some of the highlights of that report. And um, I know it's a little annoying. You have to kind of register with Verizon uh, to get a copy of the report. But uh, this is really an important report. People in the cybersecurity field um, will will look at this. Uh, policymakers will look at it. So it's a useful resource for you and something that's um, good for you to uh, keep track of from year to year. You know, all of these reports, uh, Verizon's and then the IBM one, I mean, they're, you know, they're put out by entities with their own interests, um, in some cases with, with consulting uh, type work or their own products or services that they want to sell. So um, it is always good to, you know, view them with a, uh, you know, just a little bit of understanding that they're, they're being put out to, to a certain extent to spread FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, Nevertheless, the Verizon and the IBM are, are, are viewed as, as um, pretty reliable. And of course, this, the statistical methods and the data sources, you know, if you were doing some kind of serious academic study of these things, you might question and dig a little bit deeper into. There are probably other sources of data. There are probably other methods that, uh, that could be used. And maybe that would come up with some different numbers. But again, I think these are they give us some a good general snapshot and are generally thought to be, you know, representative. So uh, the first thing from the Verizon report to notice is the rise of ransomware, and we've mentioned this once or twice already in the in the first couple of weeks of the class. And if you've been following um, data breaches and cybersecurity in the news at all over the past couple of years, you'll probably have some sense that ransomware is on the rise. And ransomware, of course, is um, when the uh, bad guys get into your system or some part of your system uh, and generally encrypt or restrict at, encrypt some of your data and or restrict access uh, of your access to, to some to all or some of your data uh, and then demand that you make a payment in order to Get the decryption key and um, and get the and get the data back. So this has been a common uh, a common tactic for a while. It's been really growing for a few different reasons. I think um, one of those reasons, which I explore a little bit in my paper that I that I gave you to read this week, is that the market for exfiltrated consumer information for things like credit card numbers or, or social security numbers is really saturated. The, the information that I found in doing that paper suggests that the average American adult has had their PII, including credit card numbers and, and name and address and social security number, um, exposed multiple times in multiple data breaches. Um, there are large volumes of this, this stuff of it available. I'll talk a little bit about it in just a minute from some of the data I saw in my paper. So, you know, that market's not as lucrative anymore as, as it once was. And um, so the ransomware is in some ways more lucrative, uh, also easier. You know, it, um, it doesn't require the initial data thief to take tranches of data and then try to sell them on the dark web. It allows uh, a more immediate uh, path to monetization. Um, and we have seen that at least in the, kind of the beginning years and in recent years of ransomware, the bad guys actually are fairly reasonable in a sense. In other words, um, they're often asking for a ransom that is uh, affordable. And you know, it's not cheap, but it's affordable. Um, in other words, it's calibrated to the market of the entity that's being attacked um, and, and reliable in a sense. Um, so there's, you know, the, the, the market value for them of the ransom data is that you in fact 
trust in a strange way that they're going to give you the data back um, once you pay. And it, for many of the established ransomware groups, that has in fact been the case in recent years. Now, there have been cases where um, you know you make a pay, people have made payments and then the ransom uh, the data has not been released and additional payments have been demanded or uh, and or uh, parts of the data have been released uh, other things like that but uh, you know there still is sort of a pattern um, of releasing the data when the ransom payment is made and um, and so a lot of entities that face a ransomware attack in fact pay the the ransom uh, and there are even consultancies that will uh, help you if you are subject to a ransomware attack negotiate with the um, ransomers and f help facilitate uh, the Bitcoin or other e-currency payments to the ransomers now um, you know the government the FBI for example doesn't like it when when people uh, pay the ransoms and and in their official kind of guidance they suggest it's not really a safe game to play and you shouldn't pay the ransom and you and you should uh, call them uh, and you know part of that is connected with the deeper connections between these groups that are doing things like ransomware attacks and organized crime groups and even nation states, particularly uh, Russian-based organized crime and um, and Chinese and North Korean-based based organized crime. So you know there's a there's an interest in um, law enforcement to try and you know track and stop this. And obviously it's just a it's just a real problem. There's a real bind uh, that a company or an entity subject to a ransomware attack is in. So you know ransomware going up. Uh, a second piece of the Verizon report that's always interesting to look at is information on affected industries. Um, and unfortunately, this piece, the way it was published, uh, was, was alphabetical. And um, it, it would be easier if, in a sense, uh, if they kind of sorted it by total. Because I do want you to sort of take a look at, you know, what industries are sort of at the at the height of being under attack so finance right that's not surprising finance is all electronic these days finance is where the money is um, not surprising you know information so um, you know kind of internet social media companies like that um, are doing business online so they have a lot of data online um, so in a sense, maybe um, maybe that's not maybe that's not surprising. Um, but you know, a couple to notice here that are relatively high up. So education, you know, educational institutions um, have been have been hit pretty pretty hard. Um, oh, and that reminds me. Actually, I, I wanted to mention when I was talking about the ransomware. You know, another reason for the rise of ransomware, which I think connects with uh, something like education showing up. Uh, relatively high on the on this list, and even healthcare, not not as high, but you know, not not small either, is COVID. So you know, during COVID, a some institutions like educational institutions had to quickly pivot to doing work primarily online in ways that we hadn't before, uh, and of course across every sector, industries had a had a pivot to remote work and um, some of those that were really sensitive to things like ransom attacks like education institutions and like you know hospitals for example um, during during COVID were really targeted um, so manufacturing right that might be one you might not think of a why you know why manufacturing and um, be a number of reasons for this uh, you know one is that one uh, impetus for a data breach uh, might be to to take trade secrets and you know manufacturing is going to be a, a strong repository of trade secrets and we see particularly um, Chinese based organized crime um, very intent on uh, and and state activity very intent on getting getting trade secrets but also you know manufacturing is uh, increasingly networked 
um, there are electronic industrial control systems that are often networked that control the manufacturing process and uh, those sorts of things can be vulnerable to attacks including kind of traditional not just trade secret data breach as well as ransomware attacks. Um, another that should really catch your attention as lawyers is professional services. Law firms are very ripe targets for data breaches. If you think about it for a minute, your, your typical law firm, uh, whether it's you know a small personal injury firm or a large corporate firm, is going to have lots of personal information on its clients. Uh, it is gonna potentially have trade secret information. There have been cases where we've seen uh, large law firms hit in uh, ways that seem to be aimed at gaining insider trading information, all sorts of things like that. Uh, and you know, bigger law firms tend to be pretty on top of and pretty good at having you know IT people and and compliance people who are aware of and watching for uh, data breach problems. But there are lots of law firms that are you know smaller in size. And again, think of that sort of typical three to five lawyer personal injury and uh, real estate and trust and estate law firm on on your street corner. Um, it just likely is not going to have the resources to, to take as much care, um, but it's something to, to really watch out for. Another thing to note from the Verizon report is the emphasis on supply chain incidents. And so we'll, we'll talk throughout the semester about some of the uh, legal implications and also you know, kind of potential ways to uh, address to some extent through, through legal risk management the problem of uh, third party risk, third party liability and supply chain attacks. So not uncommon uh, at all that you've got a um, smaller supplier to a larger entity. The larger entity might be um, itself pretty well hardened and pretty well prepared for data breach incidents, but the other supplier might not be. And so that supplier is kind of um, uh, a way in. And uh, as you notice, where it talks about nation state actors, we see this uh, quite often with government contractors um, who, who provide a way in for, for uh, bad guys to get into uh, government data. Uh, the report emphasizes, as they uh, do from year to year, the human element. So you, know, you might think of cybersecurity as primarily a technological problem. You know, there's a, there's a flaw in the code, there's a, a, a patch uh, that hasn't been developed to fix that flaw in the code or something like that. Um, and it can be that, and of course it is often that, but it's also a deeply human enterprise as well. So, you know, there's a flaw in the code, there's a patch that has been deployed by, by Microsoft or by whomever the supplier is, and the people or person responsible um, simply hasn't paid attention to that and hasn't implemented it. Um, and then, of course, social engineering type attacks, phishing attacks, where uh, somebody gets an email that looks like it's from the boss and they're really not prepared to ask questions about it and, you know, fall for a phishing attack. So things like that uh, remain big, big problems. And, you know, what that suggests for compliance is um, the need for training. So let's talk for a few minutes about the IBM cost of a data breach report. The you know, the, the Verizon um, data breach incident report is always an important one each year as and the IBM cost of a data breach report is also a big one each year. Um, so, you know, the average cost of a breach for the affected entity and, you know, when IBM is calculating this, what they mean is uh, the not just the data lost, um, but everything from the investigation time to the remediation to uh, potential legal expenses and things like that. So, um, you know, a pretty significant number for just about any enterprise. Look at the large number of organizations that experienced more than one breach. Now, something I want you to get a little bit sensitive to as we go through the semester is there's a difference between an incident, and I'm trying to write with my mouse here so it's not perfect, and a breach. 
All right, so an incident is, you know, any time that there is suspected and or detected that some uh, apparently bad actor or unknown actor is trying to influence or gain access to your system. A breach is when you know that, um, you know, or reasonably believe that as a result of, of an incident, some data has been exposed and or exfiltrated. So not every incident is a breach. There are most organizations face multiple incidents a day. Uh, and hopefully if, you know, if you're prepared and, uh, and you're hardened off and you have good, you know, protocols in place, most incidents don't result in breaches, but some incidents are going to result in breaches. You'll often hear people at, you know, cybersecurity conventions and so on say, it's not if you suffer a data breach, it's when, and there's a fair amount of truth to that. So you can see that in this IBM report, uh, the vast majority of, of organizations uh, that subject to this data suffered more than one breach. Um, and then IBM is also calculating the cost of critical infrastructure breaches. And we will talk a little bit later in the this, in this semester and as we go through the semester, what we mean by um, critical infrastructure. And uh, that can be public infrastructure, but it can also be private in infrastructure uh, that is critical to the functioning of, of the economy. If you go on and take the uh, second course in this sequence next semester, when we talk about national security as part of that course, we talk even more about critical infrastructure. Uh, IBM is also now reporting on the average cost of a ransomware attack. And note that this figure, this $4.5 million figure, does not include the cost of the ransom. Now, earlier I said the business model of ransomware is actually to make the ransom reasonable. Now, I mean, for $4 million for a ransom, that might be reasonable for a certain kind of organization, like IBM, I suppose, right? Um, a small hospital, $4 million probably is not, not reasonable. The, the actual ransom is probably quite a bit smaller than this. But to respond, you've got to do the forensic investigation. You probably have to hire an outside firm to do that. You probably have to engage outside um, legal counsel, you might have to send um, breach notices to individuals affected and so on. So, you know, all of those costs really add up. Now notice this length of time of 277 days, that's nine months. Um, so that's a significant amount of time on average that it takes to discover in fact that there's an incident that's led to a breach uh, to figure out exactly what happened and to, you know, close off whatever it is that has allowed that information to, to be exfiltrated. A lot of this time um, is, is really the, the time that elapses before the first detection of, of the breach. A big part of cybersecurity compliance is having systems in place to be continuously monitoring uh, logging, monitoring, doing other things like that um, so that you can determine if there is an incident and then if there is a breach uh, and then as best you can, as quickly as you can forensically find out um, what happened because obviously the longer uh, time that the bad guys are sitting on your system taking out data, the worse things can get. So, you know, nine months, that's still way too long and it's a, it's a, it's a big problem. Now, I just want to talk for a moment about my draft paper that I had you read. And this is a paper that I'm you know, submitting to law reviews right now. And um, it, it ought to be published you know, sometime in the next year or so in, in a form pretty much similar to, to what, you, what you have here. And you know, my main purpose in this paper, as the introduction suggests, is really to um, I'm playing a bit of a contrarian to some privacy law scholars, some well-known privacy law scholars who emphasize kind of the emotional harms from data breaches in connection with potential class action plaintiff's claims. And I have some other work that I've done that I'll show you later in the semester um, when we talk about private law and data breaches 
on um, settlements of class actions and data breach claims. I have some empirical work on that uh, that I'll show you. So um, I am a little skeptical here. I, I do think tort law has a, has a role to play, maybe even uh, an important role to play in some ways, but you know, some of the claims of emotional harm seem to me to not really focus on the details of what actually happens to individual PII that gets exfiltrated in a data breach. Now note, this whole paper, it's not about ransomware. I mean, ransomware is a different category of, um, of harm. And in a sense, it, it, it doesn't harm an individual at all because the information is just encrypted. It's not, you know, it's not used and, and sold. It obviously harms the victim. Um, but you know, this is really about individuals and what happens to your data or my data that is, that is subject um, to a breach. And you know, intuitive, it's kind of counterintuitive, I think, because you assume, well, if you know, this bad guy breached the, the retailer where I was buying sneakers and got my credit card number, they're gonna make fraudulent charges on, on my credit card. Uh, and of course, that's why they're doing it to try and make money on that. Um, but as I discuss in the paper, the dark web market for this kind of data is a bit more complex than that. So in most cases, the uh, entity that is doing the breach, like let's say again, it's uh, you know a large a, na a nationwide or a regional sneaker chain, and you've bought your your new Nikes from that chain. Uh, and your credit card is you know on their system and it's maybe um, one of a million or five million or ten million uh, pieces of consumer information that are taken as as part of the breach so that sort of tranche of information um, those in initial bad guys who got in they're just slurping large amounts of information and then often what they're doing is they're going to the dark web and they're offering that information for sale, and then some other party, very often, um, is buying that in, buying that information or buying pieces of it, and then trying to monetize it. Um, and you know, a lot of the kind of traditional consumer data breaches that we've seen involve credit card data, and some of them involve uh, also social security numbers. And you know, so I'm kind of I'm breaking up here in this in this part of the paper the different kinds of, of uh, purposes and transactions. And credit cards, um, there are two different car kinds of credit card transactions. A card present, so you actually have the card, right? Um, in, in which case, if you have the card, um, you often don't need other information, like a name or address or something else. And uh, traditionally, the way these were done was by actually creating counterfeit physical cards with a counterfeit magnetic stripe. Um, the move toward the chip and uh, chip-based cards that most of us have now has mitigated that to a significant extent. So a lot of the credit card fraud is card not present. Card not present when you buy anything online. You know, you're buying some stuff on Amazon, you're not presenting them a physical card. You're inputting a credit card number, um, a you know, a PIN number and name and address and all that and so there's several pieces of information that that have to match for a card not present transaction and one of the interesting things is sometimes a, a particular data breach won't have all of the ne necessary information for a card not present transaction so sometimes this the secondary buyers who want to monetize information available on the dark web will actually purchase multiple tranches of information and try to combine them. Um, and then also to use publicly available information. Um, you know, your information, your name and address and mine, your, uh, you know, if you have any real estate or things like that and mine, all those things are public records and you can buy them from data brokers uh, and or scrape them from the web. So they're combining different things for card not present transactions. Uh, so you have that, and you have true identity theft, what I call true identity theft and synthetic identity theft. True identity theft would be, you know, if somebody buys a tranche of social security numbers, for example, um, on the dark web, and so they say they have some my social security number and my name and my address, 
uh, and they try to file a uh, government benefits claim under my name. I, in fact, had this happen um, this past spring. I got a, I got a uh, email from the New Jersey State Division of Unemployment Benefits saying that my unemployment claim had been filed, and I was like, oh my goodness, I hope I didn't get fired, um, which, of course, thankfully, I didn't, and so somebody was doing that you know, that was true identity theft. Um, uh, and then synthetic identity theft is um, a, much more sophisticated. So the bad guys are actually taking bits and pieces of information available on the dark web. It might be a real social security number and a different name or something like that and creating a, a completely fake identity and then filing for benefits or opening lines of credit or things like that. Um, you know, information that's taken by bad guys can also be used for social engineering. Uh, so, if, you know, the bad guys develop enough of a profile on you and you are the CEO of some company, they might use it that way. Although I think more often that happens through public information like your LinkedIn profile rather than um, through the dark web. And then market manipulation, trade secret threat, theft state surveillance you can kind of read uh, you can see what those are about and read read them market manipulation is pretty sophisticated and i think relatively rare trade secret theft happens often but it's not individual pii state surveillance happens often uh, often for reasons that are really opaque i think and it's a huge problem but it's really not something that i think private law like you know tort or contract law could really address so you know, the things tort or contract law might address, um, you know, are really more these kinds of things, maybe social engineering as well. Um, but for now, what I want you to do is kind of read the parts of the paper that summarize the way the um, commercial cybercrime ecosystem works, the way the dark web for this kind of information works. Um, we will later on down in the semester when we talk about private law contracts and torts, We'll talk more about some of the arguments I make about potential remedies in in private law claims, as well as uh, toward the end of the paper where I talk about some possible um, public law interventions, and in particular ways to kind of maybe uh, tighten up some of the regulatory requirements around cybersecurity. Because, you know, of course I agree all of these things are the problems, the cost of cybercrime is a huge problem. My my dispute with uh, or debate with some of the other privacy law scholars is more about what kind of um, what kind of remedy is appropriate. Uh, so I hope you enjoy reading that this week. I look forward to seeing you online.